Hey everybody, it's Matt. Uh, I wanted to check in with you and just give you a little update. It's uh, been some crazy times here with this coronavirus. I uh, hope everybody's staying safe. I hope everybody's healthy. You're going to hear in the episode of us promoting the uh, serial murder conference at John Jay College and the Society of Professional Investigators having their meeting coming up, but uh, those have all since been canceled. And rather than re-edit the show, I just wanted to give a little announcement in the beginning that uh, that those events have been canceled. So I was going to do a training episode in the next week or two, uh, but I figure I'm, I'm going to talk about this virus and as a business owner, how do we navigate this and how do we get around uh, trying to stay in business as uh, the world is essentially falling apart in front of us. So uh Uh, Definitely uh, stay tuned for that. It's coming and uh, enjoy the show this week. We got a really great one coming up. George is, uh, he's a real character. You guys are going to enjoy it. So stay safe out there and we'll talk to you guys soon. Welcome back to PI Perspectives. This week, Matt brings George Geergis to the program. But today he's talking criminal defense investigations. He's a certified legal investigator with the NALI and is president of InSpy, the Indiana Society of Private Investigators. Matt and George reflect on some great networking events and some business tips before jumping into today's topic. So sit back and tune in to some great advice from one of the leading investigators in the country. And if you happen to be from New Jersey or New York or Brooklyn, like me, don't take no offense. George is a good guy. You know what I mean? This episode is brought to you by Crosstracks Case Management Software. Crosstracks is case management software that is built by investigators for investigators. The robust features allows organizations to manage any size caseload. The system can be customized for all types of cases including criminal defense, process service, domestics, background, surveillance, and more. Start your free trial today at crosstracks.co and use promo code PIP20 to receive your second month for free. Now let's welcome George to the program. Here's your host, private investigator, Matt Spare. And here we are, another episode of PI Perspectives. I am your host, Matt Spare, and we are uh, here today, uh, and in our presence is George Girgis from Investigative Support Unit. I had asked George to come in and talk to us today about criminal defense investigation. So, George, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Matt. I'm looking forward to being on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Now I've been practicing a little bit of my New York greeting for you. Uh, how you doing? Or no, I'm sorry. <laughs> how you doing? How's it going? How's it going? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I, how long did you stand in front of the mirror practicing that? I, I really need to know. I learned while I was doing some research about you New Yorkers, I learned there's three types of people from New York. There's people from New York, there's people from Jersey, and people from everywhere else. Wow, so I think, there you go. Sometimes there's people from, you know, you subcategorize the people from everywhere else as people from Philly. <laughs> okay, look, you're just looking to alienate everybody today. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us on the program <laughs> and, and alienating <laughs> the people that listen to the show. I met George at pretty much every association event I go to. George is there uh, lingering and lurking in the background. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> what's funny is um, the people that, that I go to and I, I talk to at these things, they're like, have you met George yet? Like, you should really talk to George. So even though, you know, you may be lurking in the background, you know, the people around you actually respect you. And um, I got to hang out uh, with you a bit uh, when we were in Michigan. And I was like, wow, this, this guy is a, is a cool guy. One of the things actually that you did that I thought was really impressive is you won the, the door prize, right? You won like a subscription to PI Magazine or a book or something. You hunted down a gentleman that we were hanging out with the night before who uh, was just getting into the, the, the business and really like he had no money. I, I was surprised he was actually there um, to go to this event and you hunted him down and you gave him your door prize, which I thought was great. And that just speaks to the type of person that you are. Um, you know, we kid around and we joke a lot, but I was really impressed by that. And uh, I was trying to kick around and think like who would be a good person to talk about criminal defense and uh, I settled on you. So thank you for being here, sir. Wow. I'm like, I'm humble. Thank you. I, have, I forgot about it. Yeah. But it is, you know, we have an obligation, I think, especially people that are in the business as long as I have been in the business. We have an obligation to help bring new people into the business, good ethical people that are going to kind of take over for us. 
what we do, what people what we forget is that, you know, the American justice system relies on investigators. It's the, the truth that is gathered that we bring the facts to the case that actually help facilitate justice. And there's only 40,000, you know, private investigators out there. And we have to bring new people. And we forget it's a very difficult arena to get into. It's a very difficult field. When you see somebody worthy to bring them on, you have to bring them on and do what we can to mentor them into uh, the field. It is a apprenticeship type business where people have to learn so many moving parts, so much complexity in what we do that it's difficult. So when you see somebody worthy, to bring into the business we have to do, I think it's our obligation to do what we can, what we can do to help them. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. Like in New York, they, they won't even allow you to take the test to be a private investigator unless you have three years experience. It's like this oxymoron, right? How do you get three years experience to get your license if you, you know, aren't already doing the, the work? So you almost have to go to work for somebody uh, to get that experience before you can actually get a license of your own. Unless you're law enforcement. If you're law enforcement, it's, it, it all equals out and you're good to go. But that's one of the things in New York that they do. Okay, so let's jump into investigative support unit. That's your business. You have been in business since 1990. You started off uh, as a candidate in a police academy, right? And then uh, tell me what happened after that. Well, I actually started my business in Indiana in uh, 2002. I've been in the business since 1990 working you know, for various companies. I've worked for majority companies. But, you know, when I first started, the internet wasn't even invented yet. It's totally different than what it is today. And just like most investigators that are investigators today, I'm not talking about people that are hobbyists that, you know, they retired from the police department, they're doing a little bit of hobby, they're doing a little bit. I'm talking about people that are earning a living. I became a an investigator, just like most of the people that became their birth into this from some kind of failure. Something happened in their life. There's something, you know, we have a different perspective, you know, it's like a investigator's perspective. And maybe with shows like yourself, things are changing, but there's nobody that in my generation that kind of grew up that said, oh, I'm going to be a private investigator or a professional investigator when I grow up. Well, we didn't unless, you're, that. You're, unless your dad or mom is one. Apparently, I've met a whole bunch of people that uh, were, were born into this business. <laughs> yeah, and that's because they, they probably didn't want to do anything else or didn't know anything else. But, you know, whether you got kicked out of the police department, whether you got you failed at whatever you were trying and then you stumbled into this profession. And just like everybody else, you know, you birthed into this profession from some kind of failure. I, uh, I actually started, you know, my career when I first started, I was going to be an aeronautical engineer, went to uh, school in, uh, 1985. I took a break, uh, cause my parents moved down to Florida and that's the year the Chicago bears won the, the Super Bowl. Good old sweetness. <laughs> Good old sweetness. So I'm taking a Christmas break from college. I go down to Sarasota, Florida, and I get off the airplane. I leave Chicago, Windy City, blizzards. I get off the airplane, and it's like 80 degrees. And I made up my mind right then and there, 19 years old. I'm not going back. Screw that. <laughs> right. Who cares, who, who cares what the Super Bowl <laughs> shuffle says, right? I'm out. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So I, 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 uh, I left school. I was going to like transfer to another school. I got accepted in a, a memory riddle down there in uh, Daytona, but then I got sidetracked with, uh, you know, 20 year old kid. What do you think I got sidetracked with? with some alcohol and some women. And, uh, so I had to find a different track in life. And the vet track led me to, uh, professional investigations. Okay. So, you know, got a job with a small firm, started catching cases, doing uh, personal injury cases, some criminal defense cases. And I go, oh, I'm kind of liking this detective work. This is kind of fun. Let me uh, uh, go into the police academy, get some real experience, you know, find out some stuff. So I went to the, I got a job with the local sheriff's office, went to the academy. I uh, left the, 
the, the academy, then you got to wait for your spot to open up. You had to wait like three weeks. I'm thinking, I can't wait three weeks. I got to get a job. I got to. So I figured I'd continue doing some PI work while uh, I'm waiting for my spot to open. And then uh, when my spot opened, I'm thinking, ah, do I really want to take a pay cut to go write some uh, traffic tickets? Right. Let wow. me just stay doing this. So yeah. I ended up staying in the private sector and uh, just continued my career and uh, been doing this ever since. Wow. And you actually are a certified legal investigator through NALI, right? Yes. Okay. So why don't you tell, tell folks exactly what that means? Well, there are certain qualifications to become a certified legal investigator, and there's a testing procedure. And there's, you also have a commitment to continuous, continuous education throughout your career. The testing procedure, I think passing a kidney stone is a little easier than the testing procedure that, that uh, you go through. But it's a worthwhile endeavor. It's more to prove to yourself that you really know the material that, you, that you're practicing, that you know your trade. Yeah, the, it's, it's a little intimidating, actually. So I, I joined NALI recently. So that's the National Association of Legal Investigators. I was very impressed, actually. They had their um, get-together down in, in Tampa. And um, just going down there and seeing the, the presentations, I thought, were fantastic. The people were great. Um, even George was awesome, which was nice. And, um, you know, it, it was just a really good time. And just seeing, like, the, there were two people that were sworn in as... Um, certified legal investigators. They had taken their tests, they got their reviews, they wrote their papers, they did everything they needed to do. And just the, in the sheer emotion of these two people, like one guy, like he broke down in tears. I mean, it was like a whole, you had to grab the mic away from him because he just went into this, you know, I would just want an Oscar speech. Uh, and you, you understand, you know, just the, the effort that it took to get to there. And that guy it was special because he was the first Canadian, I think, ever to become a certified legal uh, investigator also, uh, and just impressive the um, the background. You serve on the board of that association as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I'm the assistant national director. Okay, but uh, yeah, I, I I was there with you. I, the guy uh, was emotional, but I could relate because yeah, totally. when I got my uh, certification, it was the same kind of scenario. It was at a conference, and you're pull side and you've already done, they've already done your background check on you. They checked you out. You've uh, submitted your references. You've submitted your white paper and then you have to go through uh, an eight hour test procedure. Uh, eight hours. It's a practical. Yeah. Yeah, only only practical. eight hours. <laughs> yeah, it's only eight hours. Uh, and then by the end of the, you know, you first you do a practice, they're giving you like a, like a, like a case, like, go interview this person and you do it practical and you're being monitored how you would do it, how you do the reports, you would put, put it together and then you go in front of an oral board and you're questioned about ethical questions and ethical dilemmas and right. uh, certain scenarios. And then you have a four hour uh, written exam. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's crazy. And I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe my memory's not right, but I think they said there were like 59 active um, certified legal investigators in the country. Um, yeah, there was, yeah there's, there's less than 80. I don't know the yeah. exact number, but I think there's less than 80. Yeah. So, I mean, to, uh -huh. to hold that, that, uh, title and, you know, you go to court and you got to testify, it really, it gives you, uh, you know, it makes you sound like you know what you're talking about, right? Cause you passed all these tests yeah. and read all these books and, you know, you show up with those qualifications. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so one of the other things, too, is you are the president of INSPI, which is the Indiana State Association, correct? Yes, that was uh, that was based on an election. That was easy. Everybody just voted for me. I think well, I was. You're a likable guy, sir. <laughs> but, but, yeah, we've done a lot of good stuff with INSPI. I've, I've been uh, a member of INSPI for, I think, you know, over 10 years. Wow. And it's important to be a member of your state association. Sure. First of all, um, there is some civilian oversight. When you go to court and you testify, you say about my credentials as a certified legal investigator. Uh, I'm also a certified criminal defense uh, investigator. But when you go to court and you say, you know, uh, and this is a this is a something that's that that has happened to me. For uh, example, 
you say, you know, I have civilian oversight, I have governmental oversight because you're licensed, but you also have civilian oversight. Right. Um, and that, and that's important because these associations are not there. You have to, you, you have to, uh, practice your trade with a certain conduct. Yep. And if you don't behave a certain way, the associations will not have you. You belong to a group and that group to have you, you must act a certain way, you know, acting in a professional ethical manner. Yeah, no, it's, so it's, it's definitely it's, true. And it, it, it translates, you know, it translates to how you run your business and how you operate. Um, if you're not doing those things, yeah, you may get an account here or there, but you're going to lose that account very quickly if you're not professional and you don't have certain professional standards. Some people mistake being a member of an association as marketing or, you know, marketing themselves, networking, trying to like build up case cases like, oh, I'm going to get referrals. I'm going to get that happens naturally. It's like a collateral benefit. Right. You meet people and they right. get to know you and they're like, oh, I know this guy in South Bend. I'm going to give him a case because I know George and I, I trust him. Uh, just like, you know, I can say, hey. I know Matt in New York. I trust him. He's going to do a good job, and we get to we get to network like that. But sure. the actual networking benefit you get from an association is the mentorship. Is I can call if I have an ethical dilemma, if I have an issue, I could call various people throughout different stages of their career, and they've always given me their insight. And if anybody ever calls me, I always give them my insight. Right. So that's the real benefit is like you run into a dilemma. You're like, oh, like, you know, you're a one man shop. Who are you going to bounce this idea off? You can't go like crazy sure. thinking about it. So you call somebody, you know, maybe a mentor or somebody. I get, I get, I get questions people. all the time and I love, I love, love responding to them like quickly too. Like if, yeah, I see a question like that come in. I'll turn around, you know, within an hour or two, getting them a good a good response if I, uh, if I can. So, okay. So we're, we're going to take a quick break um, and we're going to steer this back into doing criminal defense because that, that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. But the state association stuff is, is very important as well. So we're going to jump out real quick. And when we come back in, we're going to talk about criminal defense, how you get into it uh, with some of the pitfalls of trying to do that type of work and things to be aware of. So we will be right back. This episode is brought to you by Satellite Investigations the leading investigation firm in New York. If you have any investigative work you need done in New York State, please reach out to satellite at www.satellitepi.com. And welcome back to PI Perspectives. This is your host, Matt Spare. I am joined here again today by George Girgis from the Investigative Support Unit. Welcome back, George. Nice to be back. Okay. I feel like we haven't talked in a very long time. Um, okay, so criminal defense. Um, explain to me how you got into doing criminal defense, and um, you know what was your first exposure to it, and um, how do you how do you get that type of work going forward? I think I was just exposed to it from the first agency that I worked at. We were just part of the normal cases that they were catching, and then you know you're doing attorney work, you're doing a criminal defense work. And so, you know, it, it's something that I enjoy. Um, and then also, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, you must be familiar with the uh, uh, Criminal Defense Investigators Training Council. Sure. Yeah, I've heard of it. In there, in, uh, we're out of Florida and I was in Florida and they offered a lot of training and their training was based towards criminal defense. So um, I'm also a certified uh, criminal defense investigator through the CDITC. There's about, I think, 500 people. And basically, you know, again, with some experience and you have to take some educational requirements and then there's uh, an academy course to, to do that. But Handling criminal defense, what's, what's different from other type of cases is knowing not only what to do, but knowing what not to do. Right. People often mistake uh, what we do as criminal defense investigators as, you know, we're trying to help the bad guys or whatever. But we, 
we never try to help the bad guys. Never, the people in the United States, um, you know, if somebody commits a crime, that there should be consequences to it. Absolutely. Uh, but every individual is protected. You know, they have legal and constitutional rights that we demand here in the United States. And we should always demand that due process be followed. Exactly. Yep. So, so, so that's what we do. Because if we take away that right from one American, we're taking that right away from all Americans. If one American hurts, all American hurts. Are you running for office, sir? What's going on here? <laughs> I'm just saying. So you asked me about criminal defense. This is why, because there's no money in criminal defense. Right. You, you, uh, we were talking about that off mic there, right? You do. You don't do it for the money. You don't. You don't do it for the money. You know, I. I remember sitting, I, I had a case, this is a true story, I got criminal defense cases piling up, I got a kid, you know, he's been charged with a, a crime, he, you know, I got $500 on a retainer, and I'm working a civil case, a property dispute between two landlords, you know, a commercial properties, and I find myself taking a statement, and I'm literally asking a question to the witness, so how tall was the grass? Was it ankle high? Was it higher than that? And he's telling me how tall the grass was because one of the disputes was how uh, you know people didn't maintain the 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 property correctly. And I'm as I'm asking that question, I'm thinking this case is paying my bills. I'm I'm charging like this case. The total bill was like four or five thousand dollars for right. the, that you know case. I can't get five hundred dollars to get a kid out of jail. <laughs> That's crazy, right? <laughs> but listen, sometimes you have to uh, do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do too. That's uh, that's yeah, another so thing. Also, we have this uh, this saying around here. Sometimes we we do civil work to support our criminal defense habit. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, yeah, I always wondered about that too. So, like when you. When you're marketing yourself, like, okay, so let's say you're retired law enforcement. You say, you know what? I really enjoyed criminal investigative work. I want to look into doing that. Like, how do I get those clients? Are you marketing yourself towards attorneys, the criminal defense attorneys, or do you market yourself to the public? Like, what type of route do you take? And what's what's the most successful route to take in your experience, right? Do you focus on the attorneys or do you focus on John Q. Public? Or is it a little bit of both? I, I usually focus on the attorneys. The attorneys are the ones that need the work. Um, you're working as a criminal defense. You want to work as an agent of the attorneys. So you, you're working, you're gathering the information and you're providing it to the attorneys. Um, there's a lot of attorneys that don't work, use investigators. And typically, you know, every attorney needs an investigator, especially if you're doing litigation or criminal defense, you, you need it. But, they probably got burned in the past uh, with a bad investigator. I have more problems getting hired or soliciting an attorney that's been burned by a bad investigator than having getting the work from a, a an attorney that hasn't worked with an investigator at all. So that's important to have good investigators. There's more work than there are good investigators to, to do the work. There's, there's always going to be work and we have the misconception sometimes that we compete against each other and that's one of our faults that we have as, as investigators in the private sector. We look at the, the other guy and we think that he's going to take away our business. There's so much work out there that there's only 40,000 private sector investigators that in the whole country. There's millions of attorneys. There's 300 million people. How's 40,000 people going to keep up with like what needs to be done as investigators? And, you know, from the 40,000, you probably have, you know, less than half that are doing criminal defense. Right. So uh, there's always plenty of work. As far as marketing the general public, I, you know, there's a lot of people that do that. It works for them. They have different uh, marketing styles. That's more of a business question. Right. I, I like to think of, uh, most of my business comes from a referral business. Right. You know, somebody refers somebody to me, an attorney refers somebody and there is a, a pattern. There is a strategy to build up your referral uh, network. Um, and one of those, um, when you're, when you're marketing to the, uh, maybe I'll give this as an example. If you're marketing your business or you're marketing, 
your your services to somebody that needs it to the general public, you're basically getting uh, you're getting a hold of the the person who needs that service right now. So let's say um, imagine that that person wants a, there's a, there's just a general public and he wants to hire an investigator. They walk into a room and it's like, you know, they go into the internet and there's like 20 investigators. They're all out there. They're all put out their website. They got their uh, SEOs out there. Everybody wants, you know, to, to hire. It's kind of like walking to a stock market and everybody's like throwing up their hands, you know, hire me, hire me because that person doesn't know anybody. My strategy has been a, a little bit different. My strategy is to meet people along the path of hiring an investigator. It's you go to the association meetings, you go to networking meetings, you go and you meet people that potentially are going to need investigators in the future. And you know what? You could offer them a little bit of advice. You could offer them a little bit of what I, I tidbits that don't even cost you anything. Uh, to, and you help people. You genuinely care about the people that that you associate with. And when the time comes that that individual, that attorney, that uh, member of the public to hire an investigator, he's already met one on the, on this path to hire an investigator. Because if you're trying to get the person that hasn't met an investigator, you're in a room and you got about everybody else screaming, hire me, hire me. But if you are just, if you met that person and that person needs an investigator, you're the only person in the room. You've already been hired before they even need you. Right. So that's kind of been my referral marketing strategy throughout my career. And it seems to, to work out uh, for me because I got more work than I got time to do it. So as a, a um, certified uh, criminal defense investigator, do you travel outside of your home base of Indiana? Are you going all over the country or you pretty much just stick in your, uh, in your lane, in your zone, in your area of operation? Well, you go where to, you go to work takes you. I mean, I do, uh, I'm licensed in Illinois. I do work in Michigan. I do work in Indiana I do work in the federal court system. So when you're doing different jurisdictions, it gets a little complicated because every jurisdiction has a little bit different you know, discovery rules, a little, you know, different court procedures. It's a lot easier if you're doing uh, one one jurisdiction. People that do federal work like to do federal work and follow those because there's certain rules that they follow. Right. States Guidelines courts have a little bit stuff, different yeah. mm-hmm. uh, rules where they allow discovery. You know, Michigan and Illinois have a little bit different um, charging um patterns and what they allow as far as depositions and stuff. And then you're also doing appellate work, but I've, uh, you know, you go where the case takes you. I've flown to California to talk to a witness. I've flown down to Florida to talk to a witness. You travel, you go where you go, where the work takes you, you follow the evidence. And, right. so, uh, and that's, you go where it, t- it takes you. I mean, if somebody called me, now, nobody's going to call me from uh, uh, Tampa to say, come down here and work a case. I'm not going to do that. But if I, ca- if I catch a case, you know, out of Indianapolis and I have to fly down to Tampa to talk to a witness or pull a re- or, you know, get some evidence that I need, I'm going to do that. But it's going to be a local case. So, so, um, so do you pull in somebody local? Like, let's say if you have to go to Tampa, do you reach out? To somebody in Tampa and, and team up with them, or are you just pretty much going? Yeah, it, well, Florida's a bad. I'm licensed in Florida because that's where I got first license. I always maintained my Florida license. But if I'm going to go, for example, to New York, where I'm not licensed, I would probably pull a New York investigator to come work with me. Right. So we would we would have a, you know we're working under their license and and what have you. But you know we we've, we've uh, as far as Michigan, Indiana. Uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, we got all the licensing up here. But, you know, if we're going to go anywhere out of state where we need a license, we, we would pull a, a second investigator to help us out. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing, too. Like, you just recently joined um, Aldenese, the New York State Association. So let's say, for example, yeah. you, you did get pulled into New York. Now you have a, a nice um, place to go to that say, hey, I need 
like a good criminal investigator throw it out on the message board. So you're not, not only are you using Nowy's board or NCISS or one of those other ones, but you're also um, going to the local state association. It's, it's a bigger pool, a source of local people that, um, that you can choose to, to reach out to or tap into if you need to. Cause you know, that's the thing about the local guy too. Cause if you need, let's say uh, some of the liaison with law enforcement locally there, you know, are they going to listen to Georgie coming from out of town or are they going to listen to the guy who, you know, shoots pool with uh, the officer he needs to talk to or, or something like that. There's like a better chance that they're going to be more cooperative with a local person than they are with you, even though you're incredibly charming. Um, yeah. it, it may be a little <laughs> difficult. Yeah. Well, people underestimate that people underestimate, you know, the, the local connections that people have just knowing knowing the area if you go into a place the smart thing is to do is to find somebody locally and work with that person you know first they know the area you know you don't want to be you know you, you turn the wrong corner and you're in the wrong neighborhood and you don't realize uh, what's going on um, so and the connections you know local investigators have with the court system with local authorities with uh you know, just even geographically knowing the area and, uh, you know, just finding the right person and uh, working with them. You can't under, you, you know, it's, it's underestimated a lot, but, you know, if you're doing this long enough, you realize that yeah, I'm going to fly into the New York or Jersey or somewhere. I'm going to need somebody to, to be there as a liaison for me. Definitely. And it's the right thing to do. I would be I would be careful though because you were definitely dissing all those people from New Jersey and and New York and Pennsylvania oh, no, like, <laughs> about twenty oh, minutes ago. From, <laughs> Hopefully oh, they have a short Jersey, memory. <laughs> oh, people from Jersey are the same as people from New York. There's only like Jersey people only think there's people from Jersey, New York, and Philly. Right. So <laughs> careful, like, sir. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> careful. And I've been practicing too. Yeah, like, no. I'm going to get online and uh, uh, grab myself a a flight. There you go. So, hey, tell me a little bit about panel work, uh, getting involved with the panel, doing defense, uh, criminal defense investigations through a panel. What does that look like? How does that work? And um, maybe there's some folks out there that have no idea what I'm talking about. So uh, tell me a little yeah, bit about it. It's a federal, pan- federal panel. You know, it's like a public defender. The, the, the defenders in the federal system, you know, many times have appointed attorneys. And there's a lot of attorneys that build their business based on appointed work. And uh, when the attorney gets appointed and they're allowed a certain amount of funds to hire investigator and experts. So it, every jurisdiction is a little bit different uh, uh, how, how they do it. They're trying to uniform it. You know, you basically work for the attorney, you turn in your you got a predetermined amount or a budget that you're working with. You have to sometimes put together an action plan. And if, if you want to go over a certain amount, letting them know what it's going to cost, they turn it, the judge authorizes so much funding for an investigator than the panel attorney who uh, is appointed, then, you know, would hire you. And then you actually get paid from, uh, the government itself that you're you know they submit your invoice to uh, the government and then you know if the government is hasn't been under you know some kind of closure you'll get your check within 60 or 90 days yeah i think that was that was the thing i was most impressed about because i have very limited experience doing that work i actually talked about it on a prior episode where i'd done some uh work for the federal government and everything was approved and and you know, the one thing that I was a little uncomfortable with is they were asking me for my bank account for like a direct deposit. And I'm like, "Mm, do I really want to give the federal government my bank account number? (laughs) (laughs) I was tempted just to create an account just to get paid. Uh, But I ended up saying, you know, what, that's just too much work. Uh, But I did get paid like rather quickly. And, uh, you know, once the judge signed off on uh, what my fee would be and and how it all was going to going to work, I, I got it very quickly and I had nothing to worry about. Nobody questioned anything. Uh, the work was over and done, and uh, I just kept it moving after that. Yeah, it's, you know, you do your work, you get paid. Sometimes it just depends. You get uh, sometimes it's slow pay, right? Um, depending on the politics or how long the case is going. But typically, once the case is over, your bills are submitted, and you know, within 
most of the times within 30 days, but sometimes it takes 90 days. Right. Uh, there was a, a few years ago where, you know, I don't know if you remember, but they shut down the government um, where no, no, nobody got paid and they were like furloughing and federal employees. We had a little bit of difficulty getting our getting paid until that was over, but you know nobody got paid. Yeah. So, yeah. Then after after they reopened, you know, turned the lights back on and uh, the government. Yeah, you know, I, I remember that it was like a battle battle of wills, right? Neither yeah. side wanted to budge <laughs> on anything, and it really hurt uh, folks that that did a lot of federal work. I mean, we're struggling to get by. I, I do remember that. I didn't have any of that type of work going on. Uh, for me personally, but I remember uh, the the issues on that. So, um, yeah, people can make a living doing federal work. I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of it out there, and if you hustle and you, you have enough panel attorneys as your as your clients, you know, you can make a living. And there's a lot of good people that specialize in that. And kind of like they don't have to worry about marketing. They don't have to worry about having too much office space or 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 worried about too much administration they just do the panel work they know that the, the work is going to come in through the panel they have uh, five or six attorneys that feed them work all the time and they do good work for them and they're always busy and they know you know even if they're late they know they're going to get paid eventually you know right. right well that's good so what other type of advice can you give the investigator that's just starting up uh, and is interested in getting into doing uh, criminal defense work well, I think they should uh, look into the Criminal Defense Investigators Training Council mm-hmm. and take the v- very minimum, take their component method course. There's a certain methodology that uh, is through the what they call the component method, and it kind of like puts you on a on a structure on how to do a criminal defense, and then the uh, documentation it's how you document stuff to to document for your uh, attorneys but definitely don't take it for granted just because you did criminal defense or criminal work you know criminal investigations for a policing agency that you know how to do criminal defense work uh and i'll get i'll tell you an interesting story i had a friend of mine who was a police officer and you know he was always on my case because he said that I worked on the, the dark side. He, <laughs> he was, he was uh, uh, a re- retired police officer and he did mostly insurance cases. Well, one of his friends is a, one of his high school friends is an attorney needed case on a criminal defense case. And he decided he was going to help her out. And he actually sat through a whole trial. And uh, he called me afterwards and he said, George, as a police officer, I never sat through a whole trial. I didn't realize some of the tricks that these prosecutors, the, the, I, he goes, I collected the information and I knew that they were presenting it in a way to make the guy look more guilty than what he was because it was a self-defense case that he was right. working. Right. Um, and he goes, I never realized some of these tricks that they played. And I, I, he goes, I sat through the whole trial and I, now I understand what, what you do. And I go, welcome to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I didn't realize I was of... speaking to Darth Sidious today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but, Your lightsaber is uh, red, sir. <laughs> nice. There you go. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, well, that's, but, yeah. that, 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 that's true. That's like, don't take it for granted because you know how to do a criminal investigation that you know how to do criminal defense because it's a, it's a different mentality because we're not looking just for probable cause. Like most police station, most police officers, most police investigations, you're looking for probable cause. You you're seeking the truth that you're going to, to a proof that's a different level. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm. And then, um, you know, we're always looking for the truth. And sometimes, you know, the truth is, you know, your client's guilty. What are you going to do? It is what it but, is. But right? uh, you provide that truth to your to your client, to your attorney, and they base their case off the truth. And then you always go into a mitigation stage. You're always looking for mitigators for 
as you're doing your investigation, you're not only looking for facts of guilt or innocence, but you're also looking for mitigating and aggravating factors. Right, circumstances. That makes, right. That, that makes a, a big difference. Right. And people look at you, you have to have a hard skin. People look at you kind of funny because, you know, you get it. People try to intimidate you, you know, people in the, they don't understand what we're doing. I remember uh, sitting at, uh, at a hearing, at, at a sentencing hearing, because a guy who had committed murder had pled guilty. And people there realized, you know, we were on the defense side and they were like looking at us, you know, kind of funny. What they didn't know was the reason that he pled guilty was because of our work. He wanted to take it to trial. And because of the work that we did, he decided that he was going to take a plea. And he took a plea and he saved the family from having to go through all the pain and agony of a trial. Um, So, you know, even though people look at our role as, you know, sometimes they're helping the bad guy, we actually help facilitate justice. That's, that's what we do. And the other thing is, you know, we, we don't have a badge. We don't carry badges. We don't like have any authority. We have no power whatsoever. All, all we have is our skill and our knowledge. And, you know, we balance the powers of government with that skill and with that knowledge. Right. You know, the people with no authority, the least authority, you know, challenge the government's authority on a daily basis. That's kind of like the principles of what our country was based on. You know, we the people are the, the challenge the ones with the power. And, you know, we're every day doing it and we're protecting our constitution one case at a time. That's what we do as criminal defense investigators. That's why we get up in the morning and we do criminal defense work rather than, you know, following around some lady that has a bad back on a worker's comp and we want to get a picture of her bending over, you know, picking up a bag of dog food. Yeah. I mean, it's, everybody has a different reason for, uh, for getting in and doing this kind of work and, and, you know, uh, you're definitely very passionate about doing the criminal stuff and that's, that's great, man. That's really great to see that you feel so strongly about that. And I feel like, um, you know, you're, you're the type of person that would never get tired of, of doing that type of work, right? You know, the search for the truth, this, the search to find those mitigating circumstances and those things that are out there. That's, that's something that drives you, right? You, you wake up in the morning and you say, okay, I, I need to figure something out today. What do I, what am I working on? You know, how am I closing this case today? And uh, you yeah. know, I, I think it's interesting too, cause you know, you, you do run scenarios through your head and you get different ideas of different places to look. And sometimes taking that step back and thinking about things is pretty cool too, right? Yeah. Plus whatever, whatever job can you do and like, you know, go to so many different locations, so many, you know, this job here is, is almost like a passport to like different worlds. Right. You know, you, you, I've been into, you know, multi million dollar homes interviewing somebody, and then, and then at the same day, I'm at a homeless shelter, yeah, you know, crazy, interviewing right? somebody. Uh, you know, been into a meth infested trailer, you know, being careful not to sit on some like heroin needle. And, you know, the next day you're at the, at the state uh, um, Senate House or, some, or something talking to a congressman or a senator. Yeah. So it, it, this job really takes you everywhere. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a different perspective, an investigator's perspective, a professional investigator's perspective, well, and PI perspective. PI perspectives, right? That's the whole spirit of the so show, right? Get, Get, Getting people like Georgie on here to talk about uh, their perspective on things, and that's uh, that's right. You see things that are different than the most people in the general public. Mm-hmm. You tr- you look beyond what people perceive, and you try to see, try to observe the truth. And that's yeah. pretty much the the perspective. You see things that other people don't see. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You're you're talking about. Uh, you know, going in different places and being in different places. And believe me, I'm right there with you. I've been in some crazy like situations where you look and you see like, how does somebody live this way? You know, the, 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 the amount of hoarding that's going on here where there's like literally less than a foot to get by 
Um, I've been in those situations and I've been in apartments in Manhattan where you take the elevator up to the penthouse, you get off the penthouse or stop and you're in the apartment and you look and you see a painting and it says Norman Rockwell, one of one, you know, it's like, Whoa, wow, yeah. okay. Uh, I bet that cost a pretty penny, but you know, it, and you, you see it all and that's part of the excitement of the job, right? You never know where you're going to be. Um, I know in my business model, I don't know where I'm going to be next week. I don't know what cases I'm working on next week, but man, it's been 15 years and I always got something to do in the next week. So it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how it all works. So that's, that's what I enjoyed most of it, the most about my job. I'm not really an office guy. Um, I feel like if I'm working in one location, I'm like in prison. Like the walls are closing in on me. So right. being in the field, um, and like you said, you never know where it's going to take you. You kind of like follow the lead, follow the evidence, right. you know, look for that witness. Right. And you have to, you know, make sure you're safe. You know, there's three priorities that you have every investigator, and no matter what kind of investigation you have, there's three priorities right. that uh, you have every type of case. You know, investigators, you have to safety of the investigator, safety of everybody else, and safety of property. Legal investigators, we throw an additional one in there. We have to protect our, our client, protect our attorney, because we're agents of the attorney. We don't want to do anything that's going to, like, you know, put the attorney in a, in a bad situation. So that's a little bit of difference between just uh, any investigator and the legal investigator. We have to carry that as one of our priorities as well. Definitely. I feel like you're running for office today. It's great. I'm, I'm going to vote for you. My vote's for George. Uh, <laughs> so, so how do folks get a hold of you? You get a hold of me, investigativesupport.net. Investigativesupport.net is our website. And it's uh, 888-733-3009. 888-733-3009. How's that? That's, that, that, pretty that's easy great. That works. That works. And we're going to have all that in the show notes. Um, you can get a hold of uh, George. And, and if you have a question, he loves to mentor. So <laughs> reach out to him, ask him a question. You'll probably get a good answer on it. So, hey, George, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Uh, I know we, we were talking about doing this for uh, for a couple months. So I'm glad the, uh, the stars lined up here. And um, I, I appreciate it. I feel like uh, you gave a lot of really good information here today. Um, so thank you, sir. And uh, I'm sure I'll catch you at the next association event. So I just uh, really appreciate you taking the time. For here. sure. Are you coming to Toronto? I am. I will be there. Yep. Yep. The, oh. the Nally annual conference is in Toronto. We're having it outside of the United States for the first time, I yeah. think, in the history of over 50 plus years of Nally. Yeah. We're having it in Toronto in June. That, that's so, a good one for me. It's a 35 minute flight. So I'll definitely be there. You can count me on. Oh, count me yeah. On that I, one. Uh, you got it. I'm going to definitely see you out there, my friend. Okay. All right, man. So thanks a lot. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll catch you next week on the next show. Take care, everybody. Have a good time. Thanks for checking out this episode. Hey, George is just a wealth of knowledge and experience. He really has a heart to help out his fellow investigator. Make sure you check out Nally and Inspy. A special thank you to our sponsor, Crosstracks. Don't forget the offer code PIP20 when you visit their site. Next week, Matt will speak with Patrick Andrews from Crosstracks, and they'll dig into all the ways their software can help your business. On behalf of Matt Spare, thanks for downloading and subscribing to PI Perspectives. <laughs>